very glad that you can see Craig Bender and come to speak with us today because we're hoping that he will obviate some of the tedious steps I spoke about earlier in producing a suitable closed environment life support system. Uh, very glad to see Dr. Warden back on his feet. Uh, please speak. Uh, very rapid 
ways for discovering genes. Uh, the numbers of these grew uh, quite substantially over time with the ESD method, just pulling out the expressed part of the genome. Uh, it's amazing these uh, uh, tens of millions of sequences, most of them are from human, trying to understand all the different splice variants uh, in our own uh, genome. In 1995, the big breakthrough was a new mathematical algorithm, not just sequencing tools, but a way to assemble all of these sequences. And so we had approach by breaking the DNA down into little pieces, sequencing those pieces, and uh, reassembling those computationally in the computer, we were able to come up with the first sequence genome uh, of living organism in history. Uh, that was only uh, 15 years ago. We couldn't get funding for that. The, the government review process said this couldn't possibly work. Uh, we had to use our own money to do it. Um, and after we showed it worked, uh, we were given more money than we knew what to do with to do all kinds of species. Uh, and we had good money from DOE and NIH looking at diversity, uh, first in the microbial world and then expanding to uh, plants and uh, working our way up uh, to, in 1998, 1999, doing the fruit fly genome, uh, and then in 2000, uh, the human genome. So the human genome has roughly, each of us have about six billion letters of genetic code because we have two sets of genomes, one from each of our parents. So you hear just pair of numbers, we have three billion letters or six billion letters. Um, and the first draft of this uh, came out uh, in science uh, just about 10 years ago from February, we'll be celebrating the 10th anniversary uh, of this publication uh, in a special meeting uh, in San Diego. But things have progressed first slowly, but now a lot faster since then. So in 2007, we published the first complete diploid genome. Uh, I actually used my own uh, genome, because then I didn't have to go through getting complex provisions. Um, and people said, of course, he used his own genome. Um, but it, you know, when we started this project, people were totally afraid of genetics and genomics. And how could we possibly read some of the genome and put it on the internet? Uh, since I did that and published this and put my genome in the internet, it's now become uh, the vigor to uh, do that. And uh, I think biology will proceed now in an open fashion uh, instead of a closed fashion. But looking at the 19 sets of chromosomes uh, from my parents, they actually differed from each other by about 0.5%, which was much higher than all the announcements in 2000, how we differed uh, one letter out of genetic code from each other. People just looked at homologous regions, looked at SNPs, the single base pair changes, and said we only differ by one out of a thousand. When you try to compare any two of us, we're comparing four sets of chromosomes. And so that's how we get up to one to three percent when we look at all the insertions and deletions and all the changes other than just uh, the single letter changes. In fact, there's more rearrangements and changes in the genome, more base pairs involved structural changes, insertions, deletions that are all in uh, the SNP uh, variation. So it's almost 10 times the variation I previously thought. If you think about that, so 44% of my protein coding genes have uh, one or more heterozygous variants in the protein sequence. So if, the, if we all have that same sort of percentage differences, to me it's more amazing that our biology is closely similar uh, then that things don't work on it every single one of us. Uh, most drugs work on about a third of the population. They have little or no effect on another third and have toxic effects on another third. Um, that's not surprising when you see these kinds of numbers. So understanding that variation is going to be key. When you're looking uh, at 44% variation uh, with uh, as many of uh, you know, millions of changes, uh, there's an awful lot to look at. Uh, genomics has expanded very rapidly in the last few years due to technological innovations. So what was a $5 billion uh, government worldwide program uh, that we forced to go a little bit faster, uh, now you can buy a machine about the size of this podium for a half a million dollars uh, in sequence of genome in one or two days. And that cost is uh, going down substantially. 
So genomes are pouring into the databases from around the world. So looking at that one to three percent difference, so here's looking at about uh, and Chinese, um, uh, Gubi, uh, one of the uh, uh, recent uh, sequence people from Africa, and by Vanessa Hayes at my city, comparing it uh, as a Northern European, uh, Caucasian. And you can see the degree of overlap. What Vanessa did is looked at three different populations in Africa, included uh, Desmond Tutu's uh, genome. And there was more variation within Africa than uh, between uh, uh, Gubi, uh, myself, and the, the Chinese individual. Uh, we all evolved out of these populations in Africa, uh, so it's not surprising there's more uh, variation there. Uh, but it's sort of turning uh, people's thinking on its head. So if you think about it in your field, uh, uh, some of the reading I've done uh, and tried to follow over time, uh, NASA's been doing genetic selection for a long time. We just didn't call it that. Uh, uh, because that seemed to have a bad connotation, but people had to pass rigorous tests, they had to be certain sizes. These are phenotypic selections. You know, so why not get smart and actually really do it and uh, screen for the things that might be meaningful uh, for allowing space flight? Uh, uh, the study is showing that some inner ear changes uh, allow people to totally escape uh, the effects of disorientation uh, in space, things associated with bone regeneration, uh, DNA repair from radiation, and on and on. Uh, that uh, uh, probably this list could be uh, thousands of traits long. Uh, all biology works on selection. NASA's work on selection. Uh, you know, measure a few more parameters than what you've been measuring, and, and you probably can get a better result. Uh, if we have people traveling for their whole lives and even multiple generations, uh, we might want to think about engineering these and other traits uh, uh, to enable those purposes. But we're not alone even in our own bodies. We actually have more microbes than human cells. We have roughly 100 trillion human cells. Each of you have about 200 trillion bacteria associated with you right now. Um, nothing personal. Um, but they can get very personal. So we're, we're actually born without these microorganisms and we acquire them uh, quite uh, quickly. Uh, and the gene population uh, exceeds our own gene population by orders of magnitude. So think about it right now, maybe the person next to you, especially if they're coughing, have about a thousand different bacteria in their mouths right now. Um, if you look at, uh, we're talking about maybe 10 million genes in the microbes associated with each one of us. We don't really know what most of these do. There's new studies now just coming out of it. These were discovered using the tools we developed for sequencing the human genome, the shotgun sequencing. So we can just take samples from different body cavities and sequence at once all the microbes that are there. Uh, this should have been being done uh, uh, by NASA for years now. Um, each new person that goes up in the space station is bringing perhaps 10 million new genes, organisms, pathogens with them uh, on that trip. Um, we've been doing environmental sequencing and so I'll show you in a minute in some environments such as submarines and others. Uh, and certainly I'm sure the space station uh, create a very unique uh, microbial uh, habitats. So to understand our biology, we have to understand our own genetic code. We have to understand the genetic code and the extent of these microbes associated with us. We have to understand the interactions with our immune system and then with the external environment. So it's getting more complicated uh, by the minute. But the exciting thing for me is now we know what the parameters are, at least we think we do. But I think for the first time, we actually have a chance of making some progress. Uh, instead of being ignorant that all these things exist, uh, we can know about them and even manipulate them and understand them. Here's uh, the change in different cancers uh, since 1975. Esophageal cancer is the fastest growing one. And if we look at the microbiome uh, in these individuals uh, with the esophageal cancer, they have a whole unique uh, microbiome associated with and we don't know yet if that causal or is that the result of the cancer. Uh, it becomes important. 
court to determine, uh, but also obviously in software geo cancer, people think it's clearly environmentally determined, uh, and these microbes are a key part of that environment. So what else does this microbiome do? Uh, when we look at physiology, uh, our biochemistry only allows uh, certain things to be made. Uh, our microbes uh, provide a lot of uh, that additional physiology. So what is that microbial uh, potential? So if we have 20,000 some odd genes, maybe you can get 100,000 different uh, transcripts, maybe one to 300,000 different proteins, depending on splice variants, et cetera. But the best quantification of our chemistry is roughly 2,400 different chemical compounds that we can make enzymatically from our gene set. Uh, so what happens with them? So we were to measure your bloodstream uh, after a meal, we find around 500 different chemicals circulating in your bloodstream. Only 60% of those are from human metabolism. 30% or so are derived from all those different species you ate uh, during your meal. But 10% are on the order of 50 chemicals perhaps circulating in your bloodstream right now are bacteria and metabolites. We have no idea what role they play in human physiology. Do they make you feel better? Do they protect you from disease? Do they cause disease? Do they make you depressed? Uh, all the above, uh, any of those things. Nobody has any idea. Uh, we just know they're there now and they can be readily measured. Uh, so we need to measure the genetic code, we need to measure our microbes, and we need to know all these different chemicals circulating in our blood in different environments. Uh, these would be great studies to do uh, just in existing uh, space trips now, uh, let alone uh, trying to understand for longer ones. So we're using our imaginations, and I was asked to do that. Uh, why not come up with a synthetic uh, microbiome? Um, we had a way uh, with antibiotics or uh, a way to sterilize uh, an astronaut before going into space and providing them with a synthetically uh, compiled uh, community. Uh, we can eliminate completely disease organisms, uh, maybe have no dental decay, uh, for example. Uh, from uh, reading uh, packing for Mars, I understand uh, methanogens and sulfur producers are a major problem in space flight. Um, um, except for those who want to propel themselves around the cabin. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I understand the physics of that doesn't really work. Uh, body odor is primarily caused by microbes. Uh, the French have tried to cover up things with perfume, but the best way to eliminate uh, um, a smell from your armpits or other areas is to kill the microbes. So if you use something like a 70% alcohol, you can totally eliminate uh, some of those orders. So uh, if we come up with the right set of microbes, uh, uh, we can eliminate some of these uh, uh, perhaps olfactory and even health problems. Why not add back cells that make specific nutrients or vitamins instead of having to get those uh, from the diet? Uh, unique metabolism, so for example, if we were making an algae-based food, uh, we can metabolize every part of that algae uh, with cellulose degradation of sugars, perhaps retaining calcium better, uh, et cetera. So I, I, I'm sure many of you can come up with far better advantages uh, uh, than I, I can with a controlled environment. So if we look at environments, um, uh, based on the work of Carl Rose, who started measuring 16 sRNA, uh, our view of the world expanded uh, dramatically. But it turns out even uh, the 16 sRNA was missing things by over uh, an order of magnitude. And just from simple experiments in my spaceship, it's a 95 foot spaceship uh, that we've sailed around the world, uh, taking samples every 200 miles uh, in diverse uh, environments, uh, we've come up with a very different view. We just finished sampling in the Baltic and the Mediterranean Black Seas uh, this uh, last summer. We just simply filter uh, seawater collect different levels of microorganisms, then sequence everything that's on the filters. We don't even see the organisms. We don't know what they look like. We know what their genomes look like uh, from compiling uh, all their genetic data. Uh, so it's a simple apparatus. We have a different one for sampling in air. We've been doing the air genome uh, and looking in uh, all kinds of diverse 
diverse environments. These are complex pods, but basically what you'd expect if there was a limited diversity when we first sampled in the Sargasso Sea uh, in early 2001 through 2003, we were told we'd only find a few microbes. Uh, so what we can do is put a genome sequence across the top of this and then compare things. Uh, each one of these little bars is roughly uh, 600 base pairs of DNA sequence. So if there was a simple uh, a set of organisms and not much diversity, everything would be up around the 100% range. Instead, what we found was this incredible diversity where all these organisms have basically the same 16 sRNA sequence. So we thought there was not this kind of diversity underneath. Uh, but instead of being a single organism, SAR11 may be uh, 20,000 different related organisms. Uh, in fact, if we look at this uh, broadly, it was falling out. What were thought to be basically single organisms now are of the major taxa that we're finding in the ocean. Uh, some of these uh, were unknown uh, before seeing these clouds of organisms. So if, if people talk to you about a single organism from the environment, it, it's basically a meaningless uh, concept, whether that environment is your gut, uh, the ocean, or the atmosphere. We've also looked at deep sea microbes. Uh, so this is the uh, uh, high temperature vent in the Pacific Ocean that we're all very uh, isolated this organism. This is the first archaea of genome that we sequenced uh, uh, in 1996. And this is a complete autoclave. It doesn't need uh, any organic compounds. It makes everything it needs from life, uh, from carbon dioxide and hydrogen as an energy source. Uh, so this is one of the many uh, CO2 utilizers out there, uh, and this has inspired us uh, to go in directions of capturing CO2 uh, for energy production. But part of a program we had with BP looking for uh, microbes deep in the earth to do unique metabolism of hydrocarbons, we came up with the same level of diversity deep in the earth that we find in the oceans. But something is very different about them, perhaps because of mild deep, they're shielded from radiation. They certainly don't get any UV radiation uh, there. Instead of seeing these huge clouds going down to 50% diversity, you can see things are clustered more and more like people expected initially to find in the oceans. It's a much smaller set. We have the diversity in terms of different types of organisms, but the depth from all the mutations you might see uh, caused by UV radiation in the oceans uh, doesn't occur deep in the Earth. Uh, so we have a whole range of different types of organisms that could be captured. Now, if you want to discover more mammalian genes, we have to open that there's going to be strange mammals on different planets, because there's no point se sequencing more mammals on Earth to discover new genes. It's basically saturated. But if we're looking at viruses, bacteria, archaea, we're still in the linear phase of discovery, even though we've exceeded 50 million genes now in our databases. Uh, it's still growing exponentially. We can take a sample anywhere in the world uh, out of an aqueous system, uh, and the majority of genes will be new uh, in that uh, sample. So minimal life is something that came out of our early uh, studies, in fact, uh, inspired by some uh, NASA scientists. Uh, when we sequenced this genome, uh, it's the second one in 1995, which has the smallest genome of a self-replicating organism with only uh, about uh, 482 protein coding genes and 43 RNA genes. Now, this was roughly around the time when some NASA scientists claimed they found nanobacteria and some Martian meteors. So there's a lot of discussion then about minimal life that it could be. Turns out the volume of those so-called nanobacteria were so small, you could only get a tiny piece of DNA or RNA in them. Uh, so I think uh, everybody pretty much concluded those were artifacts. These are much larger uh, cells. Uh, we're trying to understand minimal life. So we had two genomes. And we asked how many of these genes are essential for life? Uh, what's the smallest number of genes required uh, for cellular life? And ultimately, could we design and construct uh, such a minimal uh, genome? But we took a variety of approaches, uh, comparative genomics in the computer, trying to knock out genes to see which ones were essential and we realized we could only get there by making a synthetic uh, chromosome. When we looked at the first two uh, genomes that we sequenced, 
announcement. Uh, this was a study uh, out of NIH, uh, of Kuhnman's lab. You can see uh, pretty small overlap between the, the, the first two genomes. Uh, they actually concluded that gene diversity on our planet must be really small to have this extent of overlap. Uh, if they waited six more months till we had the Methanococcus genome, they would come to totally different uh, conclusions. So comparative genomics been on take so far. Clyde Hutchinson at the Institute developed uh, this technique called whole genome transposon mutagenesis. So transposons are these small pieces of DNA that jump around in the genetic code. Uh, over half of our uh, human genome is composed of these transposons. Uh, they're constantly jumping around, but they jump into the middle of a key gene that uh, we can get a disease uh, where next generations won't exist uh, with these. But because we had the sequence of the genome, we could put in these transposons which go in randomly, and then you could sequence off those and know exactly where they went in. So we were able to, over the years, develop this map of the mycoplasma genitalia genome. Every place you see one of these little triangles is where a transposon randomly inserted in the cell. So if the cell could live with one of these transposons in it, uh, we define that gene that it was in as a non-essential gene. You'll see there's some uh, little bars on here with no transposons in them. Uh, basically, we define those as essential genes. But the trouble is the term essential and non-essential is totally context specific. Uh, it turns out this cell will grow nicely on both glucose and fructose. And there's a gene for the transporter for each one. Uh, if you have both sugars in the media and you knock out the glucose transporter, the cell keeps living. And you say, well, the glucose transporter must be a non-essential gene. But if you're only growing the cells on glucose and you knock out the glucose transporter gene, the cell dies. So we can only define the genetics, including our own genetics, in the context of the environment that it's in. And I think that's an important concept when you think of these confined or limited environments. When we look at the metabolic map of the cell and then look at all the genes that could be knocked out one at a time, uh, we decided this would probably not lead to a viable cell. So it turns out there's genes that cover the duplicate function, you know, the backup systems like NASA likes to have. Um, and so if you knock out one gene, it doesn't really tell you uh, whether uh, that's an essential function. After spending years doing this, we decided the only approach was to make a synthetic chromosome where we could control completely the genetic content. So then we had new technical problems where the chemistry even permit us to be able to make these large pieces of DNA. And if we could, would we just have a large inner chemical or could we glue it up? Uh, so jumping ahead to 2003, we tried a number of approaches. We had with some very critical ethical review that I'll get back to. And we developed some techniques for error correction. So the DNA synthesizers are not great machines. Uh, they create errors in the DNA as they make it. It's an N minus one situation. The longer the piece of DNA you make, uh, the more errors. Uh, and because of that, we either need error correction methods like we published here. Uh, and what we did here, we started with a viral sequence in the computer. We made these small pieces of DNA that we assembled together to make the whole genome. And the exciting phase came when we inserted this piece of uh, inner chemical uh, into E. coli. And the E. coli genome system started reading this piece of DNA, started making all the proteins. The protein self-assembled to make the virus, and the virus showed its gratitude by killing the cells that made it, which is how we detected there these clear plaques on, on the plate. So we call this a situation where the software is actually building its own hardware. All we did was put in a chemical piece of software, and it led to making uh, this a physical structure that has biological activity. But we didn't want to make just a, uh, a small virus. We wanted to make an entire bacterial chromosome. And there were two aspects. As I said, one, could you boot up the DNA? It was easy with the viral uh, DNA in E. coli. But we didn't think it would be so easy with trying to boot up an entire bacterial genome. So this study uh, in 2007 that we published on booting up uh, and transplanting the genome, I, I think it's actually one of the most important ones our team's ever published, because we actually, by changing the genome in a cell, we completely converted one species into another. 
as you like alchemy or something to many people until you really understand the importance of DNA and the importance of genetics and how uh, life actually works. Because this is so important, I thought I'd uh, walk you through it. So we isolated the uh, DNA uh, from M. mycoides. These are uh, a, a very uh, simple cells with uh, just plasma membranes. Uh, we needed to know, for example, were proteins required to do transplantation? Because if we're just making chemical DNA, it, uh, we needed to know proteins were involved. So we treated it partially with proteinases and removed all the proteins. We added a few gene cassettes so we could select for that chromosome. Uh, it would turn cells bright blue if it uh, got activated. And we worked out ways to insert that genome into a related cell uh, in the capital colon. And we thought about this for a long time. We, we thought we would have to eliminate the chromosome in the recipient cell before we put in the new one. Uh, and we worked on a lot of ways to do that with radiation damage, chemical damage. And finally, after trying a number of things, we decided maybe we don't have to do that. And we could use the enzymatic systems of the cell themselves to do this for us. So we have this very sophisticated uh, movie uh, to show you what we think happened. So we inserted the new chromosome in the cell. And for a brief period of time now, we have a capricolum cell with two different chromosomes in it. Uh, as with the viral piece of DNA, the cell system started reading the new chromosome and started making proteins. Some of the early proteins that are made uh, are restriction enzymes. Uh, the restriction enzymes were made recognize the capricolum chromosome as foreign DNA and shoot it up. So now we have a capricolum cell with the information system, the chromosome from M. mycoides. In a very short period of time, we had these bright blue cells. And when we looked at these cells, all the characteristics of the capricolum species were gone. All the proteins that existed in the cell were those coded for by the M. mycoides chromosome. So simply by changing the software, all the characteristics of one species went away, and we had an entirely a new one uh, coded for. So we knew now we could do uh, transplant. So jumping ahead to 2008, we had teams working diligently on the chemistry to make these larger pieces of DNA. We knew we could make viral pieces accurately, so we thought if we made a series of these viral-sized pieces, we could perhaps assemble these with homologous recombination. And that's where a study of biology uh, has certainly helped us with different systems. So we made 101 of these cassettes that were 5,000 to 7,000 letters each. And then we went through this assembly process of assembling these pieces together uh, on the lab bench. Uh, first at, at the 6 kV range, then going up to 24 kV. And at each stage, we cloned these pieces in E. coli and sequenced them trying to make sure it was really a valid uh, process. But, and we kept going until we got up over 100,000 base pairs. And E. coli would only take two of the four pieces. So we started looking around for a, a new system, as Mike Montague said earlier, uh, and we uh, settled on yeast. Because not only did it uh, happily clone these larger pieces, the homologous recombination system in yeast assembled and we spent years studying Dinococcus reticularis. So this is uh, one of the earliest genomes we sequenced uh, with the DOE. Uh, this cell has four different uh, DNA elements, three chromosomes, and a plasmid. And it can take up to three million rounds of radiation and not be killed. What happens is you get a couple hundred double-stranded breaks. The chromosomes literally get blown apart. But if it's in an aqueous environment, 12 to 24 hours later, it reassembles its chromosome, and the cell starts replicating again. Now, it'd be pretty nice for space travel if humans could do that. Uh, but it's a much more complex equation uh, with 6 billion letters of genetic code uh, than a few million. But we thought we could use these uh, processors. And uh, we expended several postdoc uh, year lives on, on this, but never got it to work outside the cell. And so we're delighted that uh, we could jump ahead and use a simple brewer's yeast uh, with its powerful homologous recombination system to do this. Uh, so we were able to put just the four quarter molecules with proper overlaps 
and this a simple vector, and what this vector is in it, is an artificial yeast centromere. And so just adding a centromere, a eukaryotic centromere to these bacterial clones, uh, yeast assemble all these immediately into the entire bacterial chromosome. Uh, and that's what we reported in 2008. That was the uh, almost 600,000 uh, base pair uh, genome sequence uh, assembled uh, from four bottles of chemicals and using this assembly process. The trouble is, as is I said, these cells grow extremely slowly. Uh, we have still not been able to boot up this chromosome because we think in the six weeks that it takes to do that, the selection processes aren't adequate. We also discovered a few other things. Some of these cells have nucleases on the cell surface and they just chew up the DNA uh, as fast as you expose it. So jumping ahead, we had to solve a number of problems. Uh, Michael mentioned how we could throw in smaller pieces and good, good assembly. Uh, and so Dan Gibson, who did all this work, wanted to see if we could just throw in tiny DNA fragments into yeast and get assembly. So we could just put simple oligonucleotides into yeast and it would assemble those nicely into larger pieces. But the real breakthrough that Dan came up with after studying these reactions is this very simple single pot chemical reaction uh, that actually allows us now to automate all these processes. It's just three enzymes, uh, one that chews back the DNA, another one that ligates it together, uh, and then fills in with this fusion polymerase. So it's a one-step reaction at 50 degrees centigrade. All you do is put in these synthetic pieces of, of small DNA, and it assembles them into uh, larger pieces. Uh, we just uh, published uh, this, making the uh, mouse mitochondrial genome uh, using uh, this process. But I think the important part about it is it allows automation. We can go from the digital world to make an entire analog on molecules, potentially even booting them up. Uh, Annie Hillis and I are talking about trying to build a robot that's a self-learning robot system that could do these experiments and learn biology a thousand times faster any scientist can. We have a lot of biology in We don't know what most of these 50 million genes we've already discovered is, but if we can automate these processes going from the digital world into creating new life forms, uh, we have a chance to learn a whole lot faster. So our problem was we were assembling the bacterial chromosome inside the eukaryote. To do the transplants, we have to find a way to isolate the DNA from the eukaryote and get it back into a bacteria. And uh, uh, Gwen Binders at the Institute uh, cloned uh, entire chromosomes in yeast, uh, adding this simple yeast center here. So that gave us the ability to do these trial experiments. Uh, but we ran into a problem. Uh, it didn't work. We couldn't take the chromosome, the native chromosome, out of yeast and transplant. So it took our team of roughly 25 scientists two years to solve this problem. It turns out the DNA, when we isolate it from the bacterial cell, was methylated. And that methylation protected it from the restriction enzymes that the Capricola cell had. Uh, the genome was using its own restriction enzymes to draw it, destroy that enzyme, but it was getting destroyed first. So if we purified the specific methylases and methylated the DNA, we could then uh, readily do the transplants out of yeast uh, into uh, the bacteria. So we actually have this circle that allows us to make very rapid changes now genetically. And for those of you who work with microbes, some of the biggest limitations of working with microbes is they don't have genetic systems. So simply isolating the chromosome from the microbe, putting it into yeast, we can now modify that chromosome using the whole repertoire of yeast eukaryotic genetics. We can then isolate it, methylate it if necessary, and transplant it into a recipient cell uh, forming a new species. And we can go around the circle uh, uh, very rapidly. So we made the decision early on because of the problems of the slow growth of the mycoplasmic genitalium uh, to make a leap knowing that we can transplant the microbes genome to resynthesize that genome, even though it was a much uh, larger project. And initially, we thought DNA synthesis was going to be the limitation of the biology. So this is what we reported this spring. And so the process was, again, starting with these oligonucleotides, but now using this 
new single pod assembly method. So we did start with uh, one KD pieces. In fact, John Mulligan, who was here, uh, made all those uh, for us at, at Blue Parent uh, to speed up the process. We then took 10 one KD pieces, put them together, and then 10 KD pieces. We then took 10 of the 10 KD pieces together and made uh, 100 KD pieces. And then there were 1,100 KD pieces that we put together in these to assemble uh, this entire million-based pair of uh, chromosome. At this stage, I was totally certain that it was now just a matter of simply doing the experiment. Um, and I boldly predicted that we would have the first synthetic species by Christmas last year. Uh, obviously, I was wrong. Uh, for some reason, we could never get a living cell out of it. So just like software engineers have proofreading software, we had to develop DNA proofreading software. And what uh, we did was actually made uh, naturally occurring 100 KD pieces so we could substitute those. And so we could get 10 synthetic pieces and one natural one, and we could boot that up. So we knew there was a problem in this one piece. And part of the problem is the new sequencing technology is not as accurate as the old Sager sequencing. So even though we sequenced it, it couldn't find this one base pair deletion. So one error out of a million base pairs and got no life. Uh, so we resequenced it with Sanger sequencing, found a single base pair deletion in the central gene. Uh, and we made the piece uh, and booted uh, uh, it up. And uh, here's the, the complete map. Here's the cells uh, that resulted from uh, that transplant. Um, let, let me go back a minute. We, we did some things that, uh, when you think about the problems you could have in this you could fool yourself and fool others. Our biggest concern was a single molecule contam contamination of the native genome. We had living cells. We could think uh, that we actually had uh, made a synthetic a genome activated. Uh, it would have been a contaminant. So we started this uh, concept of watermarking of the DNA. Now, the first genome we made, we just signed our names in it. And people thought that was very unimaginative. Uh, so we got a little bit more imaginative with this uh, second uh, genome. And, and Mike Montague and Dan Smith and Clyde Hutchison developed a new code within the code within the code. So in the first watermark is the code for actually translating <coughs> DNA into English or English into DNA with complete punctuation. Uh, a large number of scientists have now solved this code. Uh, and there's an email address built into the genome. <laughs> so they solved the code and sent a, an email to the uh, web address uh, proving that they had adequately decoded it. But once you decode that, it tells you how to read the rest of it. Uh, we have 46 names of all the different scientists that have been involved in this project. And we tried to get creative and add a few quotations from the literature. So we had one from James Joyce, uh, one from Oppenheimer's biography, and one from Richard Feynman. And just to show you, can, you can never get away for free with anything. After this was published, we got a, uh, a phone call from James Joyce Estate saying that we hadn't sought his permission to use this quotation. <laughs> I know we're, we have powerful techniques, but I didn't know quite how to do that. Um, but, uh, so all this is built into the genetic code, and I think the chances of this occurring naturally uh, it is pretty uh, close to zero. Uh, so the difference is we can insert all this what would appear to nonsense DNA. In fact, part of the code is to put frequent stop codons in so we don't introduce new biology into the cell by making uh, new fragments. On the other hand, if we have one error in the central gene, you get no life. So where it is in the genome and what it is is obviously you know, very critical. This is a map of the whole genome. So uh, unlike our genetic code, uh, which is uh, only about 3% of our genome codes for protein coding genes. In this, it's well over 90%. You can see there's not a lot of gaps between the genes, so it's a much more efficient uh, system. Again, when we uh, checked, uh, there were no Capricolum uh, proteins left. It was just the proteins made uh, from this uh, modified uh, genome. So this is the uh, size range uh, that's happened over uh, this period of time. Now we know over a million base pairs. 
these techniques are so robust uh, that Gibson reassembled the genome for each experiment instead of trying to use a clone variety of them. So they're truly robust, and now that they're able to be automated, I think we're going to enter into a new era. So I like to think of all these genes we've discovered today as design components. Uh, in the electronics industry, people in the 40s and 50s had far fewer design components uh, to work with. Uh, by the time uh, we finished characterizing uh, life on this planet, this number could be two or three hundred million uh, unique uh, genes or gene uh, genes that are part of uh, uh, complex uh, gene families. We actually have software at Synthetic Genomics for designing software of life to create new organisms where we can modulate, uh, build in uh, the type of metabol metabolism. Is it going to be metabolizing sugar? Is it going to take CO2 from methane, et cetera? And building the backbone to try and design uh, a future organisms. Because there is so much gene diversity and so few scientists on this planet, we have to come up with new combinatorial approaches to make some rapid progress here. So just think if you have a metabolic pathway with only 10 genes in it, and you have 10 versions of each of those 10 genes, that's 10 to the 10 combinations. Uh, it would take forever to get there. Uh, so we're trying to build this robot that could make a million chromosomes a day uh, just for one or two scientists to work with. And it really is self-learning, uh, those scientists are probably just going to watch the robot work, what happens with robotics. Uh, and then it gets down to what all biology and selection. Uh, can you set up the right assays for selecting what you want out of it? So some of the different audiences, hopefully not this one, that's why I do this, but, but there's a lot of different reasons. Um, obviously, burning all these fossil fuels were We've exceeded the equilibrium of CO2 capture on our planet. The oceans are the largest sink. Uh, this number keeps changing. I think it's up to 3.8 uh, million tons of uh, uh, new uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, we're making more people uh, faster than we can provide the means to feed them and uh, uh, provide medicine and housing and clean water. Uh, we're at 6.8 billion now within 35 to 40 years. Uh, would be over 9 billion. Uh, like any number, I like to put it in context. I was born in 1946. There's now three people alive on the planet for everybody that existed here that I was born. Soon they'll be four. Uh, all in a, uh, almost a single uh, generation uh, that we have these huge changes. We can't provide all the means for feeding the ones now, so we need new approaches for the next generations. When we look at plants, plants are really not very productive systems. They're pretty limited. Uh, so we like others to look around and even looking at kind of modest numbers because we have to greatly exceed 10,000 gallons an acre with microalgae to make it truly cost effective for making fuels. Uh, it's orders of magnitude better uh, than any of the plant systems. We've been working with oil palm and Detroit and others. Uh, Look at the bottom of the corn. We have an economy in this country based on trying to make ethanol uh, from corn. Uh, it, it's only because there's a corn lobby, uh, not because it's a smart thing to do. So we have to try and move in a different direction. So we've been trying to work on designing what we call fourth generation of fuels and cells, uh, where sunlight is the energy source and CO2 is the carbon source. Um, you can almost go in any direction from CO2. You can make materials, you can make food, you can make fuel, uh, you can make unique chemicals, you can make proteins. Uh, and so we've been uh, working on this, and our team, uh, led by Paul Russell, had a really nice uh, breakthrough in the lab. By changing some genes and some enzyme systems, instead of treating algae growth like farming, of growing up a lot and trying to squeeze the oil out, uh, we got the cells to pump the oil out of the cells on a continuous basis. Here's a cell that makes pure C8 and C10. Uh, by changing anything along the pathway, we can make any size uh, of it. Uh, this is one of the main reasons why Exxon put $600 million on the line uh, to work with us to try and scale up uh, the production of uh, carbon compounds uh, from CO2. I don't say fuel because the goal is just to create a bio crude from the algae to go into the existing refineries to make gasoline, diesel, 
solar generating fuel. Uh, totally consistent with the existing infrastructure instead of trying to adopt to burning uh, a different type of liquid. So uh, we're, we're making some good progress along these lines, but to get to the billions of gallon scale, uh, these are not short term projects. So uh, we think the soonest there'll be anything on a substantial economic scale will be 10 years. Uh, but it's progressive. It's where we need synthetic, generally like synthetic biology, cell engineering to take over. But it wouldn't make sense for an algae uh, to evolve to produce uh, as much hydrocarbon uh, as we need from CO2. So we have to change that evolution. We have to take over. We've looked at uh, thousands and thousands of algae strains, and there's nothing within the order of magnitude naturally uh, to get where one needs to be. Uh, people have obviously looked at the algae for producing food for uh, uh, space flight uh, uh, and other processes. Uh, it's pretty inefficient in terms of what was done before. Uh, so using natural algae like this, uh, uh, I think it would take a pretty large volume uh, just to produce enough to be a, a single astronaut. Going up uh, exponentially on the production scale and engineering these cells to different substances uh, I think is totally within the realm of the next few years. Ken Nielsen at the Institute is a uh, you know, great electrical biology group that's been working on microbial fuel cells. Uh, the microbes just naturally uh, select the anode or cathode and we can take complex mixtures uh, including raw sewage, uh, generate electricity and convert that into uh, close uh, to drinking water. Nobody wants to do that kind of experiment yet. Uh, but it takes it a very long way, and it's in part due uh, to understanding this. Uh, the teams discovered uh, that bacteria actually make these nanowires that can live off of metal surfaces, pulling the electrons out of the metal uh, and using those uh, for metabolism. We just announced the uh, formation of a new vaccine company to use these synthetic approaches to very rapidly you know, make vaccines. This is based on 15 years of work we've had with Novartis on the new meningitis vaccine, which is the first genomic-based vaccine, and just finished phase three clinical trials in Europe. Uh, meningitis B is one of those diseases uh, that by the time you diagnose it in young people, uh, it's too late. Uh, they're dead uh, shortly thereafter. So a vaccine is the only preventative approach. And now we're applying this to making very rapidly new influenza vaccines. So MI just funded my institute to make synthetic fragments of every influenza virus that we and others have ever sequenced. So we're gonna have all these fragments just on the shelf. Uh, and if there's a new pandemic, uh, we're actually gonna be making uh, vaccines uh, with the new emerging ones for next year. Uh, with less than 24 hours, we can make new vaccine candidates uh, that can go right into their new cell production system get very rapid production of vaccines that we think are going to be far more effective than our century-old technology we're using today of growing things in chicken eggs. Uh, so we're trying to apply these tools in a wide variety of areas. As I said, we asked ethical questions before we started the first experiments. There's a series of reviews that have been published along the way, uh, including uh, one that uh, the Sloan Foundation funded Money Institute along with MIT look at security concerns. Uh, on our announcement this spring, President Obama immediately asked uh, the new bioethics uh, committee to deal with this as their first uh, priority, and their report out uh, is uh, due uh, very soon. Uh, this is a report from the Royal Academy of Engineering last year uh, saying the synthetic biology, synthetic genomic tools are likely to be the number one wealth generator for the next century for countries, for companies, for individuals, because they have a chance to completely change how we make uh, everything um, from food to fuel. So we're just at the early stages of this. Uh, the first stage took us 15 years. We didn't think it would take that long when we started out, uh, but uh, we developed our own funding uh, to go along with our belief that we would get there. Uh, we were relying on government grants that we've probably been withdrawn a long time ago. Uh, these are the early stages. What took us years to do, we can now do in a day. Uh, hopefully, what we can now do in a day, within a short while, we'll be able to do millions of times.
time today. And just think how that accelerates biology uh, in our understanding. So just to finally do some things for long-term space flight, obviously, we have to start looking at the genetic code of people to understand their range of biology, how to prevent diseases, to understand and predict what's going to happen, identifying traits compatible with long-term space flight. With the microbiome, understanding how microbes contribute to health and disease, uh, and trying to get uh, positive traits, and placing uh, pre existing ones. And then everything from uh, food to chemicals to materials. Uh, I, I think this list could be extended uh, indefinitely. Uh, these microbes can be self-correcting with, uh, as Dinococcus does, uh, with radiation. Uh, perhaps the only way to do that with humans is to send up a set of uh, uh, lead-covered uh, container for stem cells uh, to do replacement. But we think we can use synthetic tools to even improve on stem cells uh, to do exactly what we uh, want them to do. And then ultimately, if it's going to really be generational uh, space flight, we might want to go beyond selection, uh, ultimately, uh, to engineering. Thank you very much.
fact, we literally you get to add a thousand new traits in evolution to a cell. We don't understand these mechanisms very well. We don't know if they're cell fusion. Uh, some cells take up DNA quite nicely. So obviously continued evolution is something we have to understand with the microbes that we're putting together uh, in stress environments. Hi, Craig. I'm Orlando Santos with NASA Ames, and I want to ask you about technology development timelines. Because if you did have your crystal ball, we're going to keep running all day today. What do you think will be the first application of synthetic biology in NASA's mission, and how long do you think it will take to get there?
is learning some of the properties of these microbes and how they produce currents, how they get the ions out of heavy metals. Um, along with effects that include uh, you know, things like uh, new LED lasers where uh, you have uh, uh, material that's so thin that the uh, electron quantizes and pulls out its filter. You break one of those. There's a lot of quantum uh, engineering that built a biological system. So, We need lots of sources of new photons for uh, effectively capturing CO2 and uh, we need closed systems. We buy photons is to get some closer investment. Thank you. Uh, Doug Messier from Parabolic Art and it's a space manufacturing. Some of us are looking at that. And can you see organisms being built to assist with mining and manufacturing uh, life support systems, those types of things? I mean, I mean, to what extent you're talking about mining, but the, there are several groups, companies on this planet trying to see if microbes can enhance uh, mining of copper, uh, mining of gold. Um, obviously, the oil companies uh, were working with BP to see if we can use these deep earth microbes to uh, Enhance oil recovery, change viscosity of oil, etc. So, how and if these things apply to work on Mars is beyond my expertise. Okay, thank you. Uh, William Murray, uh, you said that some microbes have the ability to self repair DNA. Uh, it, it occurs to me that uh, if you could introduce that trait into the human genome, that one of the consequences of your work would be life extension. Well, all humans uh, have the ability to repair DNA. In fact, it was a discovery early on that we made with Bert Goldstein that mutations in some of these DNA repair enzymes are associated with colon cancer. So if you can't repair the damage that we're constantly being subject to, there's an increased incidence of cancer. Uh, basically, all organisms uh, can repair their DNA. Not all of them can do what Dinococcus reductorians can, but be blown apart and reassemble their chromosomes in the same way. Uh, but it turns out there's probably a very large number of organisms on this planet that can do it. People think it wasn't necessarily evolution to deal with radiation as much as it was drought resistance, uh, with maybe very similar mechanisms. Um, being able to completely reassemble our chromosomes like Dinococcus can uh, would be an interesting but I'm not sure what the biological consequences of that would be. But it's an intriguing idea. Hi. I'm Patrick Fu. Um, you have shown that uh, chemically synthetic genome is uh, durable and that uh, it has been created. Do you have any plan to? designed for the synthesis of the membrane proteins so that uh, those uh, chemically synthetic genome can uh, live inside. It does not need to uh, just uh, borrow other bacteria's body to, to accommodate it. Yeah, we're, we're not specifically doing that. I mean, we're trying to see if we can design sort of a universal recipient cell that we could put a variety of chromosomes into uh, and there would be enough diversity of reading that DNA so it could start making uh, almost any protein system until it could get its own system going. You know, each, you know, to get early life going on DNA, we have to be able to read that DNA. So we need tRNAs and uh, a few other components. Uh, we're trying to see if we can make sort of a basic cell that has a diversity of those uh, that could deal with wide range of codon usage and other things. So uh, I, I think that's going to be essential in terms of standardizing things for the field, but that, that may not work. Um, I think what you're talking about in terms of unique membrane protein production, we're not doing that per se, uh, but I think there's uh, 10 million things that we can all think of doing that we alone aren't going to do, so hopefully you will. There are some experiments which perhaps should not be done on Earth, for example, is uh, the uh, recent work in the physics to make micro black holes, which is uh, 
they consider it safe because Hawking says they are evaporate. <laughs> but the, the question is, are there experiments that you would like to do that are so have so potentially hazardous that it would be a good idea to do them in some remote laboratory off Earth and there's other good reason another good reason to go into space? <laughs> system in space, I guess. <laughs> I was offered an island off of the leaves, but I, I wrote a book about that once. <laughs> Good ways to measure, good ways to, uh, uh, to speed it up. 